Hello and welcome to The Flow. Those of you who find these videos helpful can assist in recommending the videos to people and churches in which you may belong. Faith communities may mention centering prayer, explaining different methods, but it's my observation that very few, if any, offer regular training or even stress a contemplative practice. In fact, most churches do not even teach Christianity as a life practice, focusing mostly on worship. Jesus never said, worship me. He did say, follow me. How does the church normally value its members? It's noted by something called average Sunday attendance. Christ does not call faith communities by maximizing average Sunday attendance. Christ, I believe, calls communities together to support one another as they explore their gifts to bring about abundance seen through a transformed life. Abundance as seen in the great meaning of what Jesus would call shalom. Shalom, meaning wholeness, peace, security, tranquility, completeness, contentment, safety, and well-being, not only for yourself, but for everyone on earth. I wash away the weak. I accept the stains of either or thinking and acknowledge its harm. But at the same time, realize that progress is filled with tiny steps. I wash away my notion of fear, fear of worthiness and confidence that God can and will use me to restore kindness, empathy, and peace. I wash to remove the muck of false anger based upon impatient needs and instant gratification. I cleanse the times I was engulfed in the distractions of personal prejudices without taking time to examine its negative trigger. I wash away false notions about myself and others, allowing shallowness of thoughts and prayers and deeds. I bathe in the realization that God sparks wonder and wonder leads to awe, and that astonishment is a major step towards transformation. I dry my hands feeling God's gentle encouragement, and that is good enough. In order to love God and neighbor, first learn to love a twig. Fruiting spurs are specialized twigs that generally shoot out from the sides of branches with many ring markings from seasons past. If you notice a twig on the ground or shooting off from a living tree, Realize that what we see as a simple twig is a microcosm of seasons past. It's not a great intellectual leap to realize that 
everyone you see during the week can be seen as a twig, and within them, a conglomeration of humanity's seasons. In order to love God and neighbor, first learn to love a twig. Vulnerability is not a weakness, a passing indisposition, or something we can arrange to do without. Vulnerability is not a choice. Vulnerability is the underlying, ever-present, and abiding undercurrent of our natural state. To run from vulnerability is to run from the essence of our nature. The attempt to be invulnerable is the vain attempt to become something we are not, and most especially, to close off our understanding of grief of others. More seriously, in refusing our vulnerability, we refuse the help needed at every turn of our existence and immobilize the essential title and conversational foundations of our identity. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. What is the first thing that caught your attention? Can you imagine the people and the scene? What struck you as important? Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, 
for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. Did you notice any metaphors? How would the metaphor affect your understanding? What is begging to be made known? Here's an assignment for you. Compare Luke's version of what is called the Beatitudes with Matthew's version found in chapter 5. Look at the differences, and there are many. One big takeaway from this comparison is Luke using the tradition of blessings and woes. I say tradition because blessings and woes are found in Deuteronomy spoken by Moses. At the heart of this passage is another tradition, honor and shame. Those who have are honored. Those who don't are shamed. Jesus reverses this social tradition, saying self-worth is not based on this formula. Trinity is not concerned with this aspect of social order. And Jesus reminds us that if you feel the same way, people will try and give you a hard time. Remember that you're in good company because the same thing happened to the prophets as well. In all the days of your life, you are blessed by God simply because you are you. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. Engage with the text. Go deeper and allow it to speak. Trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We should like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new, and yet it is the law of all progress that it is made by passing through some stages of instability, and that it may take a very long time. And so I think it is with you. Your ideas mature gradually. 
let them grow. Let them shape themselves without undue haste. Don't try to force them on. Only God could say what this new spirit gradually forming within you will be. Give our Lord the benefit of believing that this hand is leading you and accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. May the grace of God live in each breath. May the compassion of Christ animate each step. And may the spirit of truth rest in each thought. Let us walk in love. Let us go in peace.